So we've been moving through these lightning talks, and our next one is uh, Freya Jeffcott, who's an epidemiologist and a medical anthropologist working out at the Disease Dynamics Unit. I'm really looking forward to your paper, so thank you very much for being with us today. Um, a quick note be before I begin. In the abstract, I said I'd be describing the undertakings of West African public health professionals during outbreak responses. I've actually decided to change tack um, and discuss why we often forget this contribution instead. I felt it was more on the theme of the political economy. So my research normally looks at outbreaks of unknown origin in Ghana, but in the middle of my PhD, I took two months off to go participate in the Ebola response as the MSF manager for epidemiological activities in a hard hit part of Sierra Leone. Now on the ground in Sierra Leone, there was a sort of a routine to the way that the virus was removed from communities. District disease control officers would um, identify suspected cases, they would take a list of contacts, and if a suspected case tested positive, then they would monitor the contacts. And if one of them developed symptoms, then they too would be isolated, monitored, contacts taken. It was a pretty simple pattern, but it required district disease control officers to be really persistent in the face of supply shortages, hostile chiefdoms, and occasionally they'd contract the virus themselves. Um, when I returned back to the UK, I started attending those lesson learned events at very prestigious institutions. Mostly they were, what can we do better in the future? What should we fund as a sort of preventative or response measure? Um, I began to notice a bit of a disturbing trend about three or four of these in, which was uh, the although people were reflecting on their pertinent experiences, mostly uh, British nationals who'd been out there in controlling the outbreak, they consistently omitted mention of public health professionals, nationals, the ones that were actually doing the majority of the work. Now this omission was starker still because they tended, when they talked about the sort of British public health professionals and the other sort of Western ones, they would really not only discuss the sort of highly technical aspects of their work, but the sort of ingenuity they used, the way they sort of tackled an unpredictable environment, and these sorts of attributes. It's not that they said that the national public health professionals lack them, they just failed to mention the national public health professionals at all. Now, I have a few ideas about what would lead people to forget the majority of the response to Ebola. Um, and it's probably not very flattering, but it's that it challenges a dominant narrative around outbreak responses, especially in international forums. Um, this narrative suggests that if you don't mention public health professionals in these countries, there's a void, and this void necessitates filling by a foreign contingent. Now, there's a further threat um, posed by mentioning the presence of West African public health professionals, and that's that you're going to start inviting a comparison between the kinds of work conducted and their effect on stemming or curtailing an epidemic. So in, what was it? So in the Royal Society meeting in London, they were discussing uh, lessons learned and what we could do next time. And they talked about the phase three vaccine trials. They talked about the high throughput sequencing labs. They talked about the commissioning of British hospitals, um, the latter of which is the only one that made an obvious distant difference during the outbreak in stemming it but they failed to mention any of the sort of on the ground field epi that kind of gets the job done. Now, at the end of this meeting, they concluded that what they needed to invest in and do better next time was to deploy faster and that they needed to have international agencies networking much better and pretty much more of the same, but there was no real reason to think any different. Um, and at the end, they did ask for suggestions for funding and everybody wrote up their ideas. Now, I only ever really saw one real act of sort of domestic infrastructure strengthening in Sierra Leone, and it was when the WHO started going district to district. There's something called the Integrated Disease Surveillance Response System, which is this sort of bureaucratic framework for disease control that's used across all the WHO African member states. Now, it is really useful, especially for name notifiable diseases, but it's really not great at sort of novel threats like unprecedented outbreaks. Even countries in West Africa that had it really well set up, like Ghana, um, had to revert to sort of ad hoc creation designed by national public health professionals. But instead, there was an emphasis on doing this sort of bureaucratic, um, agency-less sort of intervention within the area. Um, I would suggest that this is actually an example of what Wenzel Geisler referred to as a public secret in public health. Um, I'll quickly read this bit so I don't screw it up entirely. Um, it's this sort of a capacity is unknown not because of an absence of knowledge or experience, 
Um, but because there's a sort of silencing of the awareness through a sort of tacit convention, a sort of conversational way. Most recently, I saw this sort of public secret in work actually in a meeting in Ghana. It was a CDC funding call for outbreak responses. So there was a lot of NGOs and international agencies, but a lot of like prominent Ghanaian public health officials. And district disease control officers in Ghana are fantastic, and it's well known that they're great. But even here, I saw, saw them sustaining the same sort of narrative in the conversation. If there was any reference to sort of laboratory scientists or technicians or uh, district disease control officers, it would only be the kind of things that they were getting wrong in these sorts of terms. And I think it was at this point that I realized like the depth of this sort of power play. This forgetting this narrative isn't just the language of providing resources, it's also the language of receiving them. Um, I think that's probably it. <laughs> your research, can you say that there is any dynamic movement in the, <laughs> yeah, in this kind of process of uh, neglecting uh, local expertise? Uh, because, I mean, in the last 10 years, we have seen a massive increase in uh, global funds uh, that have been criticized for targeting um, specific diseases, but forgetting about these health systems <coughs> interventions. Uh, can you see any development to the worse, basically, due to these uh, ever more increasing funding model that these global funds um, advocate? Uh, it's, so just from my sort of limited experiences in a few countries, um, it's a bit of a mixed bag. You tend to have in certain situations, especially outbreak responses, there's an initial big surge of excitement towards emphasizing sort of Western intervention and keeping all the professionals here excited and involved. Um, but then you also have some longer term strategies as much as I probably complain about them too often. The CDC does a lot of domestic disease control strengthening and a program in particular in this area that I've been impressed by is the field epidemiology training programs which look to sort of develop expertise in particular rather than specific sort of frameworks and sort of top down control mechanisms. But yeah, it's it like, I don't know, I, I can't discern a particular overall trend. It's a, bit mixed. Thank you very much.